Uh, it is our pleasure to have the Chief Baseball Officer of the Boston Red Sox with us for the first time. Craig Breslow, how are you? I'm good, thank you. This will be a p- uh, pleasure for you throughout the season. You get to come on with us almost every week. That is my understanding. Are you looking forward, are you looking forward to that? I am. I am. <laughs> well, listen, Oddballs! Well, listen, welcome and uh, <laughs> glad to have you here. And how's uh, you, you been? Uh, what do you? How long you been in this job? A month and a half? Two months? Three? A uh, l- little bit, little bit longer. How's, how's a it, lifetime? How's it going? <laughs> uh, th- things are good. Uh, you know, it's great to be here in Florida to have players and coaches and yeah. front office personnel all uh, un- under the same roof. Um, it's a chance to get a lot done, to build relationships, and have those interactions that aren't forced over Zoom or scheduled meetings. So, yeah. I'm enjoying it, um, and, and I think there's a there's an exciting vibe around this group that the players have uh, really taken it upon themselves to challenge each other, to hold each other accountable. And uh, it's been a lot of fun to watch. Um, I know you can't speak about specific players. Um, however, I will just ask you uh, in a way that you might be able to answer. Um, do you expect that you add to this ball club before opening day? Yeah, it's a fair question. It's really difficult to answer because in order for these things to line up, you need uh, you know multiple parties to come together. Um, you know, I've maintained throughout the off season that we will continue to pursue any opportunity to improve the club. Yeah. Um, but it's really it's really impossible to handicap how likely that is for okay. for things to line up. Maybe we could use like aliases or something like uh, <laughs> Orden John Gummery or something like that. Is there? Any, is, is, um, do you feel like this this team has a deficiency in any area roster wise and if so what what that is you know i think there might be a bit of a disconnect between what you would take from looking at the roster on paper and what you see when these guys are out here competing um you know i i've been outspoken about the need to improve the rotation the need to balance out the lineup a little bit and then you watch the guys you know kind of go one time through and Witt obviously had a second start yesterday and and you think there's major league talent on on this staff and guys like andrew bailey are devoted to getting the best out of them um so i'm pretty excited about what i think they can accomplish when it comes to your pitching knowledge alex cora really talked about how that is a big difference coming from heim bloom to you do you feel that when you're talking to everybody and your expertise is a little bit different than what we've saw seen in seasons past when we were with heim you know i'm not i'm not sure how i would characterize it i would say that given my playing experience uh i tend to focus on pitching Mm -hmm. um a a little bit more than maybe some others in in this position do but i also can appreciate and respect that this job has too many responsibilities for me to think that i can manage any individual department so uh, i trust in andrew and justin willard and the the rest of the pitching group um but i've had a number of conversations about kind of what the vision is uh and what my expectations are uh, nice having Theo around. Did you know that going into this job that he might that might be a possibility? Uh, so Theo has served as kind of a mentor for me for a really long time. First, uh, you know, as as the GM here when I was uh, a not even a prospect, um, more just a kind of organizational left-handed pitcher. Uh, and then he gave me my first opportunity in a front office once I was uh, finished playing in, in 2019 with the Cubs. And so whether it was formal or informal, he was always going to be someone from whom I would seek counsel, just yeah. given his experiences, the success that he's met, and the fact that he's sat in this chair before. Um, the fact that it is now formal and public just means that you know I don't have to find the corner to ask him questions. <laughs> I can do it out You can in do the it open. publicly out in the open, yeah. Yeah. And Craig, when you we you know when you got the job, the parameters that Sam discussed were those in place. Did you know exactly what the sort of working revenue and uh, payroll was going to be when you accepted the position, or was this the parameters something you sort of learned on the job of what? what the exact budget you were looking at in terms of free agent spending this offseason. Yeah, you know, I, I understand why a lot has been made of the parameters and the situation. But from my perspective, uh, you know, I think where this organization is, the excitement that we have around the young players, that's what's driving um, the strategy and, you know, ultimately the spend. So, you know, I think it's it's not super productive to, to think in, in those terms as much as it is to say, you know, what opportunities exist for us to improve the outlook in the short term and uh, balance that with our, our long-term outlook. And then when those opportunities are in front of us, I can go to ownership and, um, you know, kind of uh, lay out the, the case. And then when it makes sense, uh, aggressively pursue. And when it doesn't, look for alternatives. Well, what was the shift? I guess it looks like what it is, because I think that's the, uh, like some people, the criticism they have. But what's the shift in, 
uh, philosophy when it comes to just lowering payroll in the sense of is it because there's a lot of young talent that you're expecting to 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 see perform well and is that kind of the new shift of that's why we weren't top of the market of going after high price free agency is that kind of like the new shift that the philosophy is for the Red Sox this season well I think there's a combination of factors in in reality some of those are pursuits that we didn't line up on uh some of them are driven by wanting to give every chance for these young guys to take a step forward uh you know i think the blueprint that has been successful here for this ownership group for two decades has been developing homegrown talent and supplementing that talent with not just free agents but impact star power free agents and i think that's the model that we're going to attempt to replicate given how well it's worked but all of those things then need to line up both in terms of player interest uh and also timelines but this particular season you're not supplementing with the star power sure uh you, you know i mean I, I don't think i'm um you know saying anything that that fans and, and listeners wouldn't know which is we have not you know had the splashy free yeah, agent no, I, do, I'm, I'm trying, um, I think i'm you know just from a fan perspective which is all i am it's just a I understand what you're saying, which is we want to kind of continue that model that we've been very successful at for 20 years. I think just in this particular season, there's some reason why that that's that that addition of star power didn't line up. Yeah, and I think you know on the offensive side when you kind of go around the uh, the, the positions and you look at Cassis and you look at the excitement we have around Grissom and you know a full season out of Story and and Raffi at third and then these you know kind of young dynamic outfielders and guys like Duran and Raphael and Abreu and uh, O'Neill and and Yoshida and, and others we say we feel pretty comfortable with that group and then if we pivot to the pitching side that's certainly where we've faced our share of criticism. Yeah. Um, but we're trying to build out an infrastructure and we're trying to understand you know what we have with guys like Tanner Houck and Garrett Whitlock and Josh Winkowski and Cutter Crawford and some of these guys who have shown that they have the ability to get major league hitters out consistently. And we have to understand, you know, whether or not they can take the next step forward and uh, lock down rotation spots and be bona fide big league starters. One thing Alex Cora talked about yesterday was your role when it comes to helping with the pitch. And I think he said that he's been able to learn a lot. You've kind of taken a different approach than – uh, kind of what it was in the past with Heim Bloom. What exactly is that in the sense of your role, especially when we're talking about helping the rotation, the pitching? What exactly it, does he mean by that that you can kind of bring it to kind of layman's terms for us, you know, just idiot baseball fans who don't really know what that means? Uh, so I would never call baseball fans idiots, but what I would say <laughs> is referring to himself. In, yeah, 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 in yeah, its yeah. simplest I, terms, yeah. we, we need to be able to get guys out in the strike zone. Um, and being able to generate swings and misses in the strike zone is kind of this time-tested, uh, foolproof way of being able to prevent runs. And what that means is, you know, in the minor leagues, we need to build out stuff. We need guys who, who improve their velocity, improve their pitch shape, so that, uh, you know, the way that they prevent runs is not needing guys to hit the ball hard at other players, but the ability to generate swings and misses and uh, so we've we've installed uh, you know an infrastructure that believes in that that will focus on stuff building at the minor leagues uh, that will lean on our pitcher strengths and move away from traditional baseball thought around needing you know strike one to be a fastball down in a way uh, you know we'll, we'll Probably it will become evident very, very soon in our overall pitch usage that we're going to lean on, uh, you know, secondaries and the ability to throw secondaries in the zone and, uh, you know, ensure that every pitcher understands the optimal plan of how to deploy his pitches, the intended locations, the way that they, uh, you know, the way that they match up versus righties and versus lefties. Um, and then I think that in, another overarching theme is to really push development in the big leagues. Uh, you know, it's it's no longer the case that when guys set foot in a major league clubhouse, they're finished products. We need to continue to push development up there, and guys like Andrew and others are really embracing that. As a, as a GM or a chief baseball officer, is it surprising to you that a guy like, just a player like Blake Snell doesn't have a deal yet? Uh, you like, know, without, kind of just a comment on baseball. In yeah, general. without getting into specifics again, yeah. there are a number of reasons that things these things do and, and don't line up. Um, you know, and, and, and obviously there's uh, there are still some really talented players available on the free agent market. I have no doubt that they will find homes. Um, 
but you know it's it's really difficult for me to speak into what goes into those individual decisions. We've heard a lot about uh, not jeopardizing the future when it comes to the finances of this franchise, and I'm sure it's really difficult for you to find a balance between winning here and now, doing those flashes right now, and also thinking about the future. How do you balance that? Yeah, I think this job is constantly trying to trying to strike that balance. Um, you know, and there are times uh, history tells us when uh, you are willing to sacrifice future wins in favor of the current season. Uh, and there are times where it is probably a more productive approach to, to take the, the reverse strategy. And, you know, I think which that, one is it this year? Well, I think pretty clearly what we're doing here is, you know, trying to put together the most competitive team we can in 2024, but being unwilling to sacrifice future wins. Okay. Um, and, you know, I think the timeline, you know, how quickly that gets accelerated is largely going to be driven by the steps forward that our players take. And, uh, you know, that's not to pressurize the situation. That's to speak to, um, I think, the expectations that our players in the clubhouse have, the level of, the level of accountability that they hold each other to, um, and the support that we intend to offer around helping them to achieve their development goals. How would spending $20 million for a starting pitcher this season jeopardize future wins? How would it jeopardize future wins? Well, uh, I mean, I, w- I would imagine in the theoretical situation, you're saying this is a one-year contract and twenty. Or say million it's four years, or, eighty million dollars. Yeah, I mean, I think you know you would have to look at what is the productivity into the future, and you know, is whatever the price point um, that you would speak to, uh, is that the best use of those dollars in the future, or do, or can they be repurposed for more wins at that time? Well, because I look at you had John Lester back yesterday. Love it. This has been a great week. You guys, the whole Red Sox PR staff has been phenomenal. We've had every player. It's been the most seamless. The players have been optimistic. Characters, great. You had John Lester yesterday, which was a brilliant move. All-time great Red Sox on and off the field. The Red Sox lost John Lester. The owner came out and said it was a mistake. They then spent and corrected the mistake in free agency, overpaid David Price, but they don't win a World Series without him in 2018. That's the Red Sox we're all used to. Now we're told that the things haven't shifted. It's just we need to be better. The messaging with the fans is not working because all we hear is frustration saying, why can't we improve this team? I understand if you have to trade Tristan Casas to get a new starting pitcher, that'd be silly. He's an up-and-coming guy. He's just got to the big leagues. He's got a really bright future. He should be a pro, you know, Red Sox for life. But if it's just money and you have the highest ticket prices in baseball, why wouldn't why would a season ticket holder sit back and say I'm fine with us not having a great team this year because of what it might mean 3 years from now Yeah no I I can only speak to um you know the the empathy I I feel for fans the frustration um you know I played here I've been a fan of this organization for a really long time and I think Ultimately, what will deliver fans is the product on the field, right? And, and uh, you know, winning games um, is, is what we need to do. It's what we set out to do. It's the expectation that we need to have. Uh, beyond that, we have to evaluate every decision relative to the opportunity cost, relative to the alternatives. Um, but I think what is productive at this point is to focus on the group that we have here and ensure that we're doing everything we possibly can to optimize their performance. I have, I think, probably the the four words that you may have been waiting to hear that you didn't know you were waiting to hear. We're out of time. <laughs> 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 this is <laughs> this is it. We, we could go for a half an hour and get – but we'll have plenty of time during the season to do that. So I look um, forward to it. We look forward to it, too. Yeah. Um, and uh, thanks for taking the time, Craig Breslow. My pleasure. Thank you.